Antonio, tell me, what are you trying to build at Venice? Well, at Venice, we started with the idea uh, in 2013 of building a world-class platform, bringing the best voices in wine criticism together, and then marrying that with best-in-class distribution. And what I mean by that is using our MIT technology background to build a state-of-the-art website, state-of-the-art mobile platform, best-in-class apps, and to use that technology to really bring the voices of our team of critics, the most experienced and trusted critics in the world, to bring that to the world of wine lovers, whether they're novices or amateurs, people just starting to get interested in wine, to savvy collectors who've been buying wine for many, many years, and to people who buy and sell wine for a living. So basically the entire, the entire world of wine. Why do you call it Venice Media? Well, the idea was that we started off with really a multimedia approach, but as you may have noticed, now the website is just Venice.com. So we wanted a simple word. It's, so it's really Venice. Wine criticism is a competitive business. Yes. The wine advocate is still going. There's the wine spectator, Jancis Robinson, James Suckling, and others. How is Venice different from the rest? Well, I think we're different in that we put together several assets that nobody else has. Again, going back to the idea of having a team of the world's most, ex most experienced and respected critics in the world, best in class technology. What that really means is that we have a database of about 250,000 professionally written reviews. On Delectable, we have seven million user reviews. De through Delectable, we also have a partnership with Whole Foods and several other partnerships that we can't announce just yet. And when you put that all together, what we have is something that no other company in our space can even come close to. You're a former investment banker. How does that inform and influence what you're doing and what you've done? Well, I think more than anything else, I was lucky to work alongside some very, very smart people and just have really great training on running a company from a fiscally responsible standpoint. I have a great team of co-founders in this company, starting with my wife, Marcia, but James, who runs Delectable for us, Alex, who's my business advisor. Everybody has a shared vision, and I think that what I learned in finance was really about building teams and really thinking about how to run a company responsibly. And again, that's something that I don't think a lot of our other peers have. And you can see that by some of the, some of the decisions that they've made, some of the decisions that we've made. In a business like yours, how important is the nature of the capital that you work with and the way that you structure the capital in your company? I think our company is just like every other company. You know, we're balancing growing uh, and making investments. Uh, you know, we're very fortunate that we're in, a, we're in a business that has some very defensive qualities that we like a lot. So the wine business, the wine industry as a whole, is a very defensive industry. Um, wine sales and per capita consumption in this country have gone up basically since statistics exist. So that creates a very, I think, a very positive macro environment. And our core business is selling subscriptions. We sell subscriptions with a higher than 90% renewal rate. So that creates a very stable and predictable flow of revenues. And so we have that to sort of play off of and then balancing that with our ambitions for growth, which are significant. You have investors. Are they investors with you because they're wine lovers or are they investors with you because they're looking for an exit? I think that um, we have some partners. Um, there's no institutional capital in Venice, but there are friends and family investors that we've had so far. And I think that in this day and age, you know, people who've done well are very careful with their assets. And I think that everybody is eventually looking to, to exit at some point. For me, this is what I plan to do for many, many years. Do you think of yourself as the next Parker? Not at all. Why? Uh, because Steve Jobs said you can't live your life trying to be somebody else. So that, he's one of my biggest influences. And I've never wanted to be a replica of somebody else because a replica is never as good as the original. Bob is a, a genius, fantastic, one of a kind. Um, we're going to be something completely different and I have no, no desire to be some version of somebody else. Different in what way? Um, every decision that I've made at this company is completely <laughs> anathemic to what Bob did with his company. Um, all, of our, uh, all of our writers are extremely involved in the business. One of my guys just called me right before I came here to tell me about something, a, a development that was happening that, that could have been inter that was interesting. Uh, I want our writers to be partners. All of my senior people are locked into the company. They all have equity or they have a path to equity based on business results. That's something that we never had at Parker. Our, our benefits are world class uh, and everything that we've done at Venice is completely different from that model. You notice, you asked me why did I call it Venice Media, Venice doesn't really matter. The bottom line is this is not my company with my name. This is a company with its own name, 
a great team of people, both on the editorial side, the business side. I've got three young people in my office who are all in their early 20s who are going to be superstars. It's my job to make them superstars, and that is a very different environment from the environment that I came from. You make it sound like the Wine Advocate was a disaster as a company and a miserable experience as an employee. No, it was, it was great, because I got to work with Bob Parker when he was at his prime. You know, and Bob was like a second father to me, and we talked on the phone all the time, and he gave me great advice. And um, So why antithetical to everything that he did then? Uh, because I think we're going to have a very a much more positive outcome in when we're ready to at some point exit this, which is not anytime soon, but I'm, I'm much more of a longer-term thinker than Bob. So I'm, I try to make 30-year decisions, and I'm sure I don't get them all right, but I'm really thinking about the future and Bob had a much shorter time horizon for the decisions that he made. So again, everything that we've done at Venice is really antithetical to the world that we came from. That's not to disparage that world, because I had a great experience. I traveled in Napa Valley with Bob, I tasted with him, we talked about wine constantly, I learned so much about him. But again, back to your original question, it's not my desire to be some replica of somebody else, because I think, frankly, we can be something much greater. From the outside, it kind of looks like you're trying to demolish the house that Parker built, right? You left the wine advocate. Yeah. You merged with one of his chief rivals. Yeah. And you just hired his successor, Neil Martin. Mm -hmm. So are you? I think what that says is that all the best people want to work at our company. And that's really what we strive to create starting in 2013. We wanted to create a world class company that would attract the best in class talent. Um, you know, Bob could have done a deal with Steve Tanzer in the 90s if he had wanted to. He didn't. We did. And you know we are all about execution. We say what we're gonna do, and then we go out and do it. We have a track record of doing that over and over and over. When Steve Tanzer, who is the most experienced active wine critic in America, wants to work with us, that says something. When Alessandro Masnaghetti, who's the best cartographer of wine vi of, of vineyards, wants to work with us, that says, that says something. When Neil Martin, who's a superstar wine critic, with enormous experience in Bordeaux and Burgundy and the former lead critic at The Advocate wants to come and be part of our team, that says something. And there will be more additions to our team because what we're building is a world-class company that is going to attract the best and the bright brightest. And not just on the content side, on the technology side, on the digital side, our office, and at every level what we're trying to, we only hire superstars and we're looking for those superstars. So Neil Martin is a Bordeaux guy. Bordeaux and Burgundy. Yeah, you do some of that too. Yeah. How are you guys going to divvy that up? Well, I think it's fantastic because it's the first time that going, let's talk about Bordeaux first. So Bordeaux is still the, the world's most desirable wine from the standpoint of just production, right? So First Growths will produce 20 to 25,000 cases of wine. That is just an enormous amount of wine. You look at something like Harlan Estate, for example, in Napa Valley, maybe 2,000 cases. So you're just talking about a total, totally different order of magnitude. Bordeaux also has a global appeal. It, it appeals to the Brits, it appeals to, to, obviously to us in America, obviously it appeals in Europe, it appeals in, in all the Asian uh, economies as well. So our thought was, wouldn't it be amazing if we could offer our readers two independent views on these great wines separate from each other? So Neil is gonna cover Bordeaux the way he's always covered it. You know, he's got a very unique writing style, idiosyncratic, witty, funny, British, that's his take, and I'm gonna provide readers more with my take. I grew up tasting with Bob. I probably have a palate that's much more closely aligned to his way of thinking, and you know, whenever we tasted together, we would always agree on which were the best wines, and he was really my biggest inspiration for entering this profession in the first place. So you've got Neil, who's very British, and me, much more American, and our readers are gonna have both residing at Venice, and that will make Venice really the only place that you need to go to to learn about wine at any level, going again back to whether you're just getting started or you're a collector or if you're in the trade as well. Will you and Neil Martin review the same wines? Absolutely, we're gonna review the same wines. I mean, That's well, new. Yeah, exactly, nobody's ever done that, it's totally no. innovative. Now, there may, be, there may be some areas where we don't cover every single wine, you know, some small production wine here or there, but for the most part, you know, 95% of the wines, and I would say 100% of really desirable wines, we're gonna have parallel views on those wines. So you'll be able to see, you know, La Villas Cas or Chateau Margaux or whatever, you'll be able to say, well, what did Martin think? What did Galoni think? Side by side. So you think that's going to do more for your customers than it is going to confuse your customers? Well, I think people are very smart and, and <laughs> I think people can handle it. I think having two opinions is going to be fantastic. And that's really in Bordeaux. Again, it gets back to the idea that those wines are desirable to so many different people. 
And those wines just have an appeal and a, just a reach that is really unlike any other wine in the world. Uh, and then uh, there's other areas that Neil will just cover on his own, for example, New Zealand. Um, and in Burgundy, he and Steve Tanzer will cover Burgundy jointly. That's another area where there's just so many producers, Eric. I mean, it's just every day there's a new estate that, that merits a visit, that merits a review. So I think we're in really great shape. Why is most everyone still using the 100 point system? Because it's simple and, you know, it's kind of what we grew up in, with in school. You know, my, my son came home the other day, he had an 85 on his test, and we know that that's not necessarily the best, but there's room for improvement. And sometimes he gets 100 on a project and, it, you know, you immediately understand what that means. There's an elation with when, when my son comes home with 100 points on his project, there's this elation. When he comes back with 85, we're sort of thinking, okay, you know, where could we have done a little bit better? And it's very intuitive. And that's one of the geniuses of Bob is really to, to make it very simple. But 85 out of 100 on yeah. a math test yeah. is still 85 things right out of 100 possible I things right. I love your right. perspective. I should have brought my son. 85 on a wine score is not the same. Nobody gets 25. Nobody gets 50. 85 could be fine for an $8 wine that you're going to drink on a Wednesday night with takeout. It is not good for a first growth Bordeaux. So it's relative. Remember that for um, all wines, just being in the realm of a publication like Venice in and of itself is already an achievement. Obviously, it's not for, for great wines, but if you're looking at emerging, emerging regions or budget wines, just to be reviewed in Venice at, let's say, an 85 or 86 point score, that's still an achievement, especially for certain wines at certain prices. So, I, you know, you've got to really be careful with the scores. That is the other side of, the, of this rating business, the other flip side of the coin that is sometimes not quite so positive, which is the idea that things might get discarded because of their score without, having, without taking into account the broader context. Can anyone's palate dominate the wine criticism business the way Parker's did? And should anyone's palate dominate it the way his did? I just think the world is very different today. You know, the, I mean, it's just a totally different world. It's probably not healthy to have a single person dominating the world. The, 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 it's the, not even wine criticism, it's the wine industry. Yeah, it's prob that's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, but I think that there's just such an opportunity right now with social media and technology to reach such a massive number of people that I think it's possible that one or two people will actually have more influence than Bob Parker did because they will, they will Again, this goes back to your first question, not trying to be a version of somebody else. You see this in sports all the time. It's like, oh, well, nobody will ever beat this record. And then somebody comes along, you know, it's like tennis, Pete Sampras, nobody's ever gonna win as many Grand Slams. Now you have two guys who are ahead of that and one knocking on the door. And, and so I think a lot like that. There's a lot of my inspiration really comes from, from music, which is my first career and also sports. Somebody always comes along who's better and, and or faster or more talented or whatever. So. I think it's quite possible that there will be one or more people who will be much more influential than Robert Parker was because the world, the audience for wine is much bigger. The ability to use, to leverage technology and social media didn't exist in his time. And so people may become influential, not necessarily through just what they write, but through a suite of different things. Why did Parker have such a profound impact on prices? Well, because I think he was writing about wine at a time when there wasn't a lot of information. So for example, um, now there's a tremendous amount of free information out there. Some of it is quite good. Uh, back in the some day... Some of it's as good as what it costs you. Yeah, some of it is as good as what it costs you, but um, that's certainly our belief. But there, you know, you've got to acknowledge that there's, a, there's a, also a sharing of information that's widespread that didn't exist back then. Um, when Bob started, there wasn't much wine tourism, meaning people didn't travel to the chateaus and taste wines. Today I've got friends who go and visit these estates, they know the owners, they have a lot of their own information, people are much more informed today. So that was the, that's the first thing. When, when Bob was tasting these wines starting out in the early 80s, mid 80s, there weren't a lot of other people doing that. Number two, he had the, the guts to really take strong positions. And this is one thing that is fantastic about the 100 point scale. I have to say, is it a 92 or a 96? I can't waffle with this, you know, this British 30 point system which nobody really understands how it, mean, under, how it works except for them, God bless them. Um, the, let's say five stars, is it four, is it four and a half? You know, you can really you know, keep people happy with a four or four and a half you know, out of five score. But if you have to say it's a 92 or it's a 96, that requires conviction. And Bob has always had an extraordinary amount of conviction. And the last thing that he did, which was great, was he really democratized this whole business, which is like saying, I don't care if you're a count 
or you're a peasant farmer making wine in your garage. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. I'm going to call it the way I see it. And he really democratized uh, the whole business of wine ratings by really taking it away from perceived hierarchies. And the place where this is the most, the, the most marked is in France, because France is a very hierarchical society where uh, the chateaus are ranked in Bordeaux, the vineyards are ranked in Burgundy. I once said to a producer of Burgundy, a very famous producer in Burgundy, that her, one of her villa, village wines was better than one of their premier crews. And she says, oh, no, it can't be. It's not possible. This one's a village and this is a premier crew. That's the mindset. To an American, these things are almost impossible to really comprehend. But you know, this time we're talking about 35 years ago, 30 years ago that he was doing that, saying, I don't really care what your pedigree is. The wine is either good or not good. And you know, take your class system and shove it. Yeah, in other so, words. And so there's that. And then, you know, the 80s was the beginning of the longest bull market that we've ever seen in America. And so this confluence of factors, you know, created uh, a myth and a person with the wind at the back. And, you know, you, I mean, I worked when I worked in finance, you were asking, I worked in finance with a lot of people who started their careers around that same time. And these people were very smart, very hardworking, but also extremely lucky. Because if you, if you were in the right job in the early 80s, you know, you had the ability, the opportunity to amass an incredible amount of wealth and to be extraordinarily, extraordinarily successful. My generation has had to deal with a lot more challenges. That's why I think we're actually much better poised for the future. My first job in finance, the first thing that happened was long-term capital, 1998. <laughs> then the tech bubble melted down. Then there was a uh, mutual fund trading scandal. You know, that was all like within about five or six years. And these are the things that I had to deal with as a young executive. My peers who were 20 years older didn't know how to manage in crisis. They'd only seen Black Monday. They'd just been in a big bull market. It's very different. So I, I'm very lucky people of my generation or a little bit younger have actually had to deal with a lot more crises. I think that's actually good for learning how to cope with challenges in business. Is impact on price the best way to define influence? It's a way to uh, I think describe influence. I think another way is, you know, Bob also championed certain categories. So not, you know, for example, the, the Rhone Valley, which was considered kind of a backwater. Backwater. I mean, he really brought up this whole region. Sure, there's been price appreciation since then, but I'd argue the biggest real value there is really bringing those wines to to, to a broader to prominence, market. You know, and and. Um, you know, when I first started reviewing the wines of Piedmont back in 2003, 2004, out of my, my, my little tiny apartment in, in Beacon Hill in Boston while I was at business school, you know, I was the only person like having student loans with Citibank drinking Barolo, but I guess it paid off. Um, when I first started about writing about those wines, nobody cared about those wines. You know, you asked what happened to Parker, how to become so influential. You know, with Piedmont, there was no information about those wines. All of a sudden, I start my first publication, Piedmont Report. People have something to read. Maybe they like it, maybe they don't. But there's a, an availability of information that didn't exist. Today, these wines are as coveted as, as Burgundy Grand Cru. You know, you used to be able to buy a case of something. Now it's you can buy a bottle. It's three times as expensive. It's unfortunate. But I think it's, you know, kind of all related. So influence is not necessarily related just to pricing, I think. What did you learn from Parker? Uh, I mean, a lot. You know, he was my great teacher. I think probably the biggest thing I learned from him was how to deal with pressure. So you said, you know, what is it like to, to be a wine critic? I think one of the things is at this level, you're having to manage and deal with an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of pressure from basically all sides. And he was very good at dealing with that and very good at giving me advice on how to deal with certain situations. So, I mean, you know, he was really my mentor. I mean, I worked, the, the reason I went to work for him was because he said, look, I need somebody to take this thing over when I'm ready to you know, retire. So already from the very beginning, it was, that was the relationship. Then uh, I worked alongside him very closely. There was a management team. Of, when I left, there was a management team of four people. I was one of the four. It was me, Bob, and his two investor partners. So I was at, you know, the front line of every decision that had to do with marketing, sales, the business. I knew that thing inside and out. Obviously, you know, we tried to buy it, so I had diligence the business extensively multiple times. And I learned everything from him, everything that I, was, that I needed to learn at the time. So he was a big role model for me, and uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous experience. And then in 2011, he, it was when he had a knee replacement surgery, he asked me to take over Napa Valley for him, which was huge. That was the biggest region of his core regions. 
that he had given to another person that had never happened before. The Wine Advocate started in 1978. So you can imagine between 1978 and 2011, all of those years, that was the first time where he took one of his key regions, one of the core, core regions, and, and trusted it to somebody else. Big responsibility. So, you know, I learned a lot from him, and I'm really grateful for that time. It was a fantastic time. Antonio, you know all about this term, the parkerization of wine. What do people mean by that? What is parkerization? Well, you know, there's a lot of pressure in the, in the wine business. Um, I think it's great to think about the little vigneron in Burgundy where you go and you taste the wine out of the pipette and it's in a cold cellar with moss. And that's the romantic side, the side that I really love a lot. But you can't deny that there is a big business behind wine. You know, LVMH just bought 60% of Colgan in Napa Valley for $60 million. It's, it's a big business. And the business of wine is a $300 billion plus dollar business. So you cannot deny that there is a very big business part of wine. And what that means is that there is pressure on winemakers to produce that coveted score, that 100 point score. And so what happened starting in the mid 1990s is that there was a very deliberate uh, attempt particularly in Napa Valley, to craft wines that would please Bob and would garner that score. As much as anything, because a lot of it is really bragging rights, you know, among owners and being able to say, oh, I've achieved this or that. You know, a lot of these people don't really, it's not about the money at some point, it's just about the, about the pride of saying, this is my achievement. And so there was a lot of copycat winemaking in the 90s, but I think that that has really faded now, uh, thankfully. And uh, because I think that is unhealthy. You mentioned before, is it healthy for one person to dominate? This is the manifestation of things that are not so healthy. When wines all start to taste like each other, they're all made by one consultant. There's kind of a recipe, you know, because what would happen, quite honestly, is some wine would get a 100 point score. Um, an owner would instruct their winemaker to go out and buy that wine and then basically replicate it. You know, and I'm not sure that that's so great. There, wine is fantastic for many reasons, but one of them is extraordinary diversity of place, of vintage, of, of of winemaker's spirit, and it's a shame to have that all be standardized. I think now we're in a very different world. Many wine aficionados complain that Parker pushed Bordeaux down the wrong path, pushed Napa down the wrong path. Did he? I don't think anybody put any a gun to somebody's head, Eric. I mean, people are, have to be responsible for their own decisions. If these owners made their, that decision, wherever it is in the world that they made it, they made it on their own. Uh, there are people who did not make it, that not make, did not make those decisions. And funnily enough, a lot of those estates now are, uh, are being appreciated for not having done that. So I think we're all adults. People have to be responsible for their own decisions. Bob was, was very influential, but he didn't force anybody to do anything that they didn't really want to do anyway. So the industry has fully recovered from his influence? Well, I wouldn't say it's fully recovered, but I, you know, because you can't just be critical. I mean, what Bob did was he also got people interested in wine. You know, a lot mm. of, there's, you know, I mean, his influence... There are two sides to the coin. There's many sides to this coin, <laughs> maybe three or four, because it's not just about influence on pricing or influence on regions, but just getting people to drink wine. You know, the per capita consumption of wine has gone up every year for the last 15 years, uh, but you know, obviously it started even you lower You attribute some of that to him. Well, I think that starting in the 80s, for sure, he got baby, his generation, the baby boomer generation, interested in wine. And back then, wines were affordable. Today, it's very different. The entry point for a... 30 to 40 year old is very different than what it was in, in the early to mid 80s when an average professional, a college professor, a, somebody with a, you know, a, a regular corporate job could afford to buy first growth Bordeaux by the case. Today that's not really the, the case for that sort of person unfortunately. But he got people into wine who weren't even into wine. And that, the effect of that is much greater than whether some wine went from being $100 to $150 or whatever. So he loved wines that people describe as big, yeah. that had a lot of fruit, that yeah. tended also to have a lot of alcohol. Yeah. What's fashionable now? Well, first is I, I think, you know, that's a slight mischaracterization because I think Bob has always appreciated a lot of different styles of wine, but he was associated with that style and he never really did anything to sort of dispel that. Uh, but I've hung out with Bob at his house and drunk wines that don't fit that profile at all. So I think that's a bit of a mischaracterization. But, Today, I just think that people recognize that diversity is a beautiful thing. I mean, just Napa Valley, Bordeaux, I mean, these, these estates, these chateaus, they each have a story to tell. And I think that, you know, people got tired of those, those, those really big fruit bomb wines. They're just not exciting. They don't develop well, always, not always, but that's what happens. You know, the, you said, what is the influence of wine critics? You know, I think ultimately the public is right. And so when wines 
let's say, from Australia or Spain in the early mid-90s got huge scores, not just by Bob, but by a lot of people. And then 10, 20 years later, the auction price is the same as the release price or lower. The public is telling you, we don't really like those wines. We don't care what the scores are. And there is a lot of that sort of people tasting wines made 20 years ago and saying, hmm, maybe this was not our best effort. So I think today it's much freer. People are making much more gentle wines. Uh, it's not just the way, winemaking, it's also the way you deal with the vineyard. I mean, all this stuff eventually goes back to the land. Uh, there was a concept that you had to stress. This is another very classic mid-90s concept, mid concept. You had to stress a vineyard to get the best results out of it. Today, people are more like, I want to love my vineyard and treat it nicely. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of a multiple layered question. But the, the, the bottom line is that there's never been more diversity in wine than there is today. There's never been more parts of the world that are making really good wine that are making wine today. Consumers have never had more choices than they have today. It doesn't matter whether it's the rosé you're going to drink on a Saturday night in the summer, your Tuesday night pizza wine, or a special wine you want to drink on a weekend with your significant other, anniversary, whatever. There's never been more choices. And that's really, the, I think, the most important thing about the state of the wine business today. How important is China's influence? It's, it's very big, but it's still small in the sense that the per capita consumption is still just a, about a tenth of what it is here in the United States and well below what it is in developed uh, Europe, for example. So I think that the potential there is huge, obviously. Uh, I mean, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. But do they set the price or the palate at the margin I think of the so. high end? Well, I think so far what we've seen is that there's the, the, the major interest is really in brands. Okay, so um, more so than even vintage. This is a very, you know, as you know, very, a lot of these countries are still very brand driven, but people are sort of figuring it out. And I think that these are countries that are newer to wine and people will become very savvy very quickly as has happened with other products, not, not, not wine. And so I think that the, the potential there is huge. The biggest problem with more emerging type countries is really the distribution of wine. Is it available? You know, so if I wrote an article on great Napa Valley wines or great Bordeaux, how much of that wine can an average person still go out and buy? That's a, that is a bottleneck. But that, I'm sure, is going to get resolved. The potential is, is enormous. Are you building a business in China? We're doing a lot of things. <laughs> well, tell me a bit about it. <laughs> well, I mean, so far, we've been fortunate that we have had um, tremendous opportunities in the United States, in Canada, and Western Europe. But we have two people who have significant experience in, in Asia and in China. One of them is Ian Dagata, who writes for us in uh, mostly in Italian wines and French wines, but he lives in Rome and he spends a lot of his time a year there. And also Neil, uh, Neil Martin we talked about earlier. Um, Neil's wife is Japanese. Uh, he spends a lot of time in Asia. And I think that you know, with these two, two people on our team now, we're very well poised to, to do something. Antonio, what do you make of the huge investments going into wine right now? The new wineries and cellars in Bordeaux, for example. The astronomical prices being paid for land in Bordeaux or in Burgundy. Well, I think it's a sign of a very healthy market. I mean, so some of the transactions we've seen recently, we talked before about Colgan and LVMH. Um, Ovid was sold to the family that owns Silver Oak. Um, Gallo has made massive investments in vineyard land. Uh, I think all of that M&A activity uh, really points to a very active market, a really growing market. Nobody buys these properties thinking that they're going to lose money. So. I, you know, I think it's, it's very positive. I mean, that's certainly better than the, than the flip scenario. So, but again, it's, this, it's, it's coming to the realization that wine is a big business now. Nobody buy, makes these investments without thinking he can make money. Yeah. Francois Pinot buys Claude d'Etat for $25 million a hectare. Yeah. How on earth do you ever make a return on that kind of investment? Because it's an investment in the land. It's not, a, it, you know, people always, and the brand, people say, well, um, you know, uh, the bottle price is X, and he's going to have to raise it to Y, and it'll take... You think about it in yield terms, yeah, right? Yeah. People, yeah, people say, oh, it'll take 100 years to pay that back, but, but these people are not making those kinds of investments for that reason. They, they are, this is an investment in land and a brand, multi-generational for sure, and thinking about selling it at some point for something far above the entry price number one. Number two, ultra high net worth people like Mr. Pinot run out of places to put money. And, and land is a diversifying asset. So I'm sure that that is in the thought process of a lot of these transactions that are driven by ultra high net worth individuals. But as a wine lover yeah. and as someone who in his college dorm 
in Boston had to afford wine while on student loans, don't you worry about the impact that these transactions are going to have on prices? Of course I worry because it means I can't afford the wines anymore and neither can most people. I mean, that's basically the, the long and short of it. Uh, but I'm not sure what, what am I, you know, what can I possibly do about this? I can just tell you that when I go to Burgundy, you know, where Clos de Tarte is, and I, t I can taste at DRC or Leroy, and those are wines that are astronomically priced, my greatest satisfaction is going to some little village that nobody goes to and tasting wine with a producer that, that gets no coverage and writing those reviews up on Venice because those are still, which I did last year and I'm doing again next week, these are still wines that normal people can afford, not just a bottle of, but maybe you know three bottles, six bottles, 12 bottles, whatever it is. And that to me is the real joy. So while it's true that some wines, there is this sort of you know, bifurcation of this market. There are some wines that really become luxury goods. They become unaffordable. There's still, because of improvements in farming and technology and just general know-how, there are still so many wines out there that deserve love, that normal people like us can still afford to buy, that are deserving of coverage, and we highlight those wines. So I'm not sure that, you know, I, what I can do about what Mr. Pinot is willing to pay per hectare in Burgundy. But what I can do is look for wines that are still affordable, and there's more of those than ever before. A hopeful note. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Thank you, Eric. That was terrific.